This program is brought to you by Stanford Hospital and Clinics. Hi, uh, my name is Yann Meunier. I'm the Director of International Corporate Affairs and Business Development at Stanford Hospital and Clinics. And our guest today is Josh Fisher, Dr. Josh Fisher, who is the head of uh, GI Oncology at Stanford. And let me ask you first, Dr. Fisher, what do you do exactly as the head of GI Oncology at Stanford? Yeah, it's not always obvious, is it? Uh, well, I take care of patients with GI cancers, and that includes cancers of the esophagus, stomach, uh, pancreas, and colon. Uh, we also run a, a very rich research program uh, that covers the laboratory to the clinical uh, arena in which we test new drugs or new treatments for cancer patients. And we're always on the, out, on the lookout for new ways of preventing cancer so I can go out of business. Um, I also run the clinical trials office at, at Stanford. In that uh, context, I oversee the office that, that uh, runs the operations for all the cancer research, all the clinical cancer research going on uh, on campus. Well, thank you very much. Now, in terms of prevention, what is the status of colorectal cancer prevention in the States in 2011? Yeah, you know, colon, colon cancer is probably among the most preventable of all cancers. Certainly among the common cancers, it's the most preventable. And I think that it's important to get that message out to, our, to the community. Uh, we know that colon cancer predominantly arises from polyps that can arise in the colon. And these are little, little growths that can be the size of your thumb. And we know that if a polyp goes bad and becomes a cancer, it can spread and do all the terrible things that cancer can do. We also know that if we can recognize those polyps before they have a chance to become cancer, we can take those polyps out and actually prevent colon cancer. So it's a, actually among the most preventable of all the cancers that we treat. So what can people do uh, to prevent colorectal, ca colorectal cancer? Not only in matter of screening, but also in lifestyle. So we all wish that there was a magic vitamin that we could take and, and that would get rid of cancer, and maybe someday there will be, but we're far, falling far short of that. There are certainly correlations with diet and behavior, and if we could get everyone to go out and exercise vigorously, and if we could get everyone to eat their fruits and vegetables and decrease their meat consumption, uh, we may be able to decrease the risk of colon cancer maybe by 20% or so, perhaps in some estimates as much as 30%. So there's no doubt that healthy lifestyles are part of the, uh, of the factor. But as you, you and I both know, it's not so easy to convince people to adopt healthy lifestyles. And even those that we do, they still have a risk of colon cancer. So it's not good enough to be healthy. Now, of course, I should add that smoking is also one of the culprits in causing colon cancer among so many other cancers. So doing away with smoking would be a good start uh, in any case. So doing away with smoking, uh, having excellent uh, exercise activities uh, built into your lifestyle, having lean body mass, uh, we'd all like to be thin, uh, having a, a good healthy diet, all those are factors, but nothing beats actually finding those polyps and removing them. Because sadly, even people with healthy lifestyles can get a polyp, and if that polyp goes bad, they can get a cancer. So the mainstay of prevention uh, these days is colonoscopy. Well, there are a number of ways of detecting these polyps. Um, probably the simplest is to do a, a test on the stool. Now, nobody likes to talk about stool and, and, and conversation, but I think that, that we should acknowledge that stool uh, can sometimes contain blood. And if it contains blood, it's important that we know where that blood came from, because that blood could come from a cancer or a polyp. Uh, and so there are stool tests that every doctor knows how to do. And there are newer stool tests that are more and more sensitive that, be, that people are being, uh, that, that investigators are studying. But that's the simplest of all tests. Now, there are, of course, better tests or more sensitive tests in which patients can have direct visualization of their colon. The uh, one way of doing that is to actually um, put some dye into the colon, take x-rays, and you can see the inner line of the colon if you do that kind of a dye study. That's not used very much anymore, and it was not as sensitive as we once thought it was. By all, by all means, the best test is direct visualization, where you can actually look at the inner lining of the colon. And fortunately, there are a number of ways to do that. Uh, there are scopes. These are thin, uh, flexible uh, tubes that can go up through the anus into the rectum. They can go up in the rectum and all the way around the colon, which is four or five feet long, and can see the entirety of the inner surface of the colon. 
And if you see any polyps, then that same uh, doctor, the gastroenterologist, can just go ahead and pluck that polyp out. Now, it's important to know that not all polyps become cancer. Uh, only some have the potential to become cancer. But we do know if we remove those, we significantly reduce the risk of that person ever developing cancer. So we have different scopes of different sizes. Some scopes look at the first third or so of the colon, the, or last third of the colon. Uh, some scopes go all the way through. And then there's something called virtual colonoscopy, which is a imaging, uh, CT-guided imaging, in which, uh, by the miracles of software nowadays, a person gets a CT scan, and the CT scan is reconstructed by three-dimensional imaging so that you can imagine that you're flying through the colon just as if, just as if you had a scope. So those are all different uh, approaches to actually identifying a polyp. So colonoscopy ha doesn't have a very good name. You know, people kind of fear uh, having a colonoscopy. Can you reassure the, the, the people here out there that colonoscopy is safe? Yes. <laughs> I, I think it does need a different name, actually. <laughs> Maybe you should take the colon part right out of the <laughs> word colonoscopy. Uh, but, uh, but we don't have marketing people that bright, I guess. So the, the colonoscopy is... Uh, uh, no one would voluntarily walk into a doctor's office and say, would you put this tube five feet long up, up my, uh, my bottom? And, and that is a, a concern. The colonoscopy, probably the toughest part of colonoscopy is the night before the colonoscopy. Because in order to see all the polyps, you have to have a clean colon. And so in order to have a clean colon, uh, the doctors give you uh, medications to take, liquids to take that will actually clean it out. So in order to get a clean colon, you have some diarrhea the night before. Uh, once you get through that, you go ahead and, and have a colonoscopy with various levels of sedatives so that you can be comfortable. Um, and then the doctor will do the procedure, most of the time with a minimal amount of discomfort. And in fact, many times with no discomfort whatsoever and barely memory of the event. Um, and the doctor will go ahead and, and just simply look up through the colon. And if the doctor finds any polyps, they can simply remove them. And there's no pain with removing the polyps. So it's not as if there are pain fibers with that minor uh, surgical clip that they use. They just simply clip off the polyp, take a sample, and send it off to the pathologist. Um, so the entire procedure is really not a, a, a horrific experience. Uh, it does take probably one work day. Uh, out, of, out of your life. But I think that's a small price to pay every 10 years to significantly decrease the risk of ever dying of colon cancer. People who don't want to have a colonoscopy often cite uh, perforation or bleeding as side effects. That's uh, the reason why they don't want to do it. Well, uh, certainly any procedure that we do in medicine can have side effects. And, and there's been a lot of press recently about CT scans. and and what risk is the radiation of CT scans. So we have to, we have to take those into account whenever we make uh, recommendations across the board. And so we do look, we, we do reserve colonoscopy for those people who we feel are at some reasonable risk of developing colon cancer. So we would not do colonoscopies on 20 year olds, even if they wanted them, um, uh, unless there was a clear, clear clinical reason that they needed it because their risk is so low. Now, if somebody had a family history of colon cancer or had a gene that we knew could give rise to colon cancer, we would start recommending screening even at 20 or 25 years old. But for, uh, for, since colon cancer becomes more frequent or more common in, in an older age group, we generally start colon cancer screening at age 50. And we feel that the risk of a 50-year-old developing colon cancer is high enough that it warrants getting this procedure. Now, that risk has to be balanced by the very rare side effects of the procedure. And then there are, is a possibility of, of going up there and having a very small hole in the colon. And that's what you refer to as a perforation of the colon. And that sometimes can be very serious, even in emergency. And other times, it's just a reason to watch the patient more closely. That happens in, in fewer than a fraction of a percent of patients. So it's really, really quite rare. Um, otherwise, I think that the main side effect is a day off of work or life or whatever else you're doing, because it does take your energy out uh, for that procedure. Uh, but you can return work to work the next day, certainly. Uh, it is a little bit of, uh, of discomfort uh, of going in and having the procedure. You're fatigued, and you have a night the night before where you have to have a number of bowel movements in order to clean the colon. But 
I think it's, overall the risk and the benefit are fairly well established in favor of the benefit, providing we're looking at the right population of patients. And finally, I would, like, I would like to ask you about the future of colorectal cancer prevention. Are we going to move one day beyond colonoscopy or? Oh, absolutely. I think that uh, all of our cancer tests uh, are imperfect. Uh, we have yet to find the tests that will detect the cancer in every individual who has it or will be, will be able to tell us that that individual has no cancer with, with absolute certainty. Uh, but I think our tests are getting better and better. And with further research, with further clinical trials, I think that uh, we're developing new colonoscopes that are safer. We're developing uh, new DNA tests to look for the DNA and, and that's characteristic of cancers. Uh, we're looking at uh, blood tests even now that, that have tremendous potential for, de for helping us determine whether a person has a colon cancer or not. These are all really on the horizon. None of them, uh, they're, they're not quite ready for prime time, but, but they're getting there. And I, I'm, I'm optimistic that we will have something as simple as a urine test or, or perhaps a stool test still that will give us a yay or nay on whether somebody needs a colonoscopy to, have, to remove a polyp. So we're getting there. So uh, has colonoscopy been successful in preventing colorectal cancer in the United States? Well, absolutely. There, there's no doubt that uh, the incidence of colon cancer has come, come down, uh, we think, because we're identifying these polyps and removing polyps. So, so the risk of dying of colon cancer has come down for two reasons. One is because we have much better treatments for colon cancer. Uh, our, our new drugs, uh, better surgeries are, are more effective for patients who are diagnosed with the disease. Two is that we're diagnosing colon cancer earlier, in part due to tests such as colonoscopy, and hopefully by getting awareness out to the community that colon cancer, the symptoms of colon cancer, and, and how to recognize it so that we can get an early diagnosis for patients. An earlier diagnosis for almost every cancer leads to a better outcome and better chance of cure. And thirdly, and I think most importantly, is that, that through uh, greater adherence to uh, screening guidelines, whether it's stool tests, whether it's uh, colonoscopies or virtual colonoscopies by CT scan, we're beginning to recognize polyps, remove polyps, and therefore decrease the, the uh, incidence of, of even developing a colon cancer. Well, thank you. But one of the limiting factors is access to the procedure. What is the cost of a colonoscopy, and is it covered by all uh, health, health plans? Yeah, that's a very good question. So access is, is the key. It's one thing, I mean, I've given talks where what if we had the cure and nobody could afford it? And it's a, it's a, a critical point, particularly now as the healthcare debate looms large. Um, well, the cost varies, of course, and, and I think that the Medicare reimbursement varies. But if you are an individual who's out of work and not of an age that we can get Medicare and, and all of a sudden find yourself with no insurance, you can have a rough time getting a colonoscopy. There are stool tests, as I said, that are much less expensive that have been proven to decrease the risk of dying of colon cancer. But in order to just go to, go to a doctor and say, I want a colonoscopy, that doesn't always happen, even for those people who medically should have it happen. Now, we're working legislatively to try to change some of these things. We're, of course, uh, uh, trying to get health care plans to uh, require screening, cancer screening, as part of what they offer to patients and to pay the full cost of a colonoscopy. Uh, we're trying to develop safety nets for those people who do not have insurance because uh, even $500, if I said that that was the cost, that's too much for some people if it means taking meals off their kids' plates or not paying a month of mortgage. And so it's a huge problem and we need to have a safety net. What I can tell you is that the cost of taking care of someone with cancer is huge. And, and if we could just prevent the cancer, it would be so cost effective. Thank you very much, Dr. Fisher, for this very enlightening and insightful talk. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I enjoyed it.